know, one of the intense pleasures of travel and one of the delights of ethnographic research is the opportunity to live amongst those who have not forgotten the old ways, who still feel their past in the wind, touch it in stones polished by rain, uh, taste it in the bitter leaves of plants. Just to know that jaguar shamans still journey beyond the Milky Way or the, the myths of the Inuit elders still resonate with meaning or that in the Himalaya the Buddhists still pursue the breath of the Dharma is to really remember the central revelation of anthropology and that is the idea that the world in which we live in does not exist in some absolute sense but is just one model of reality, the consequence of one particular set of adaptive choices that our lineage made albeit successfully, many generations ago. And of course, we all share the same adaptive imperatives. We're all born, we all bring our children to the world, we go through initiation rites, we have to deal with the inex inexorable separation of death. So it shouldn't surprise us that we all sing, we all dance, we all have art. But what's interesting is the unique cadence of the song, the rhythm of the dance in every culture. And whether it is the, the Penan in the forests of Borneo or the voodoo acolytes in Haiti, or the warriors in the Kaisu Desert of northern Kenya, the Curandero in the mountains of the Andes, or a caravansary in the middle of the Sahara. This is incidentally the fellow that I traveled into the desert with a month ago. Or indeed a yak herder in the slopes of Chomalungma, Everest, the goddess mother of the world, all of these peoples teach us that there are other ways of being, other ways of thinking, other ways of orienting yourself in the earth. And this is an idea that if you think about it can only fill you with hope. Now together the myriad cultures of the world make up a, a web of spiritual life and cultural life that envelops the planet and is as important to the well-being of the planet as indeed is the biological web of life that you know as a biosphere. And you might think of this cultural web of life as being an ethnosphere, and you might define the ethnosphere as being the sum total of all thoughts and dreams, myths, ideas, inspirations, intuitions brought into being by the human, human imagination since the dawn of consciousness. The ethnosphere is humanity's great legacy. It's a symbol of all that we are and all that we can be as an astonishingly inquisitive species. And just as the biosphere is being severely eroded, so too is the ethnosphere, and if anything, at a far greater rate. No biologist, for example, would dare suggest that 50% of all species are morbid or on the brink of extinction because it simply is not true. And yet that, the most apocalyptic scenario in the realm of biological diversity, scarcely approaches what we know to be the most optimistic scenario in the realm of cultural diversity. And the great indicator of that, of course, is language loss. When each of you in this room were born, there are 6,000 languages spoken on the planet. Now, a language is not just a body of vocabulary or a set of grammatical rules. A language is a flash of the human spirit. It's a vehicle through which the soul of each particular culture comes into the material world. Every language is an old-growth forest of the mind, a, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of spiritual possibilities. And of those 6,000 languages, as we sit here today in Monterey, fully half are no longer being whispered into the ears of children. They're no longer being taught to babies, which means effectively, unless something changes, they're already dead. What could be more lonely than to be enveloped in silence, to be the last of your people to speak your language, to have no way to pass on the wisdom of the ancestors or anticipate the promise of the children? And yet that dreadful fate is indeed the plight of somebody somewhere on earth roughly every two weeks, because every two weeks some elder dies and carries with him into the grave the last syllables of an ancient tongue. And I know there's some of you who say, well, wouldn't it be better, wouldn't the world be a better place if we all just spoke one language? And I say, great, let's make that language Yorba. Let's make it Cantonese. Let's make it Kogi. And you'll suddenly discover what it would be like to be unable to speak your own language. And so what I'd like to do with you today is and sort of take you on a journey through the ethnosphere, a brief journey through the ethnosphere, to try to begin to give you a sense of what, in fact, is being lost. Now, there are many of us who sort of forget that when I say different ways of being, I really do mean different ways of being. Take, for example, this child of the Barasana, the northwest Amazon, a people of the Anaconda who believe that mythologically they came up the Milk River from the east in the belly of sacred snakes. 
Now this is a people who cognitively do not distinguish the color blue from the color green because the canopy of the heavens is equated to the canopy of the forest upon which the people depend. They have a curious language and marriage rule which is called linguistic exogamy. You must marry someone who speaks a different language and this is all rooted in mythological past. Yet the curious thing is in these longhouses where there are six or seven languages spoken because of intermarriage, you never hear anyone practicing a language. They simply listen and then begin to speak. Or one of the most fascinating tribes I ever lived with, the Warani of northeastern Ecuador. An astonishing people first contacted peacefully in 1958. In 1957, five missionaries attempted contact and made a critical mistake. They dropped from the air eight by ten glossy photographs of themselves and what we would say to be friendly gestures, forgetting that these people of the rainforest had never seen anything two-dimensional in their lives. So they picked up these photographs from the forest floor, tried to look behind the face to find the form of the figure, found nothing, and concluded that these were calling cards from the devil, and so they speared the five missionaries to death. But the Warani didn't just spear outsiders, they speared each other. 54% of their mortality was due to them spearing each other. We traced genealogies back eight generations, and we found two instances of natural death, and when we pressured the people a little bit about it, they admitted that one of the fellows had gotten so old that he died getting old, so we speared him anyway. <laughs> but at the same time, they had a perspicacious knowledge of the forest that was astonishing. Their hunters could smell animal urine at 40 paces and tell you what species left it behind. In the early 80s, I had a really astonishing assignment when I was asked by my professor at Harvard if I was interested in going down to Haiti, uh, infiltrating the secret societies, which were the foundation of Duvalier's strength in the Tonto Makut, and securing the poison used to make zombies. Uh, in order to make sense out of sensation, of course, I had to understand something about this remarkable faith of Vudun. And voodoo is not a black magic cult. On the contrary, it's a complex metaphysical worldview. It's interesting, if I asked you to name the great religions of the world, what would you say? Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Judaism, whatever. There's always one continent left out, as the assumption being that sub-Saharan Africa had no religious beliefs. Well, of course, they did. And voodoo is simply the distillation of these very profound religious ideas that came over during the tragic diaspora of the slavery era. But what makes voodoo so interesting is that it's this living relationship between living and the dead. So the living give birth to the spirits. But the spirits can be invoked from beneath the great water responding to the rhythm of the dance to momentarily displace the soul of the living so that for that brief shining moment the acolyte becomes the god. That's why the voodooists like to say that you white people go to church and speak about God. We dance in the temple and become God. And because you are possessed, you are taken by the spirit, how can you be harmed? So you see these astonishing demonstrations, voodoo acolytes in a state of trance, handling burning embers with impunity, a rather astonishing example of the ability of the mind to affect the body that bears it when catalyzing a state of extreme excitation.